Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the well-renowned C developer and author Renee Shepard. Renee is the owner and founder of Renee's Garden, a well-known seed company based in Northern California that has introduced many international specialty vegetables and herbs for both home gardeners and gourmet restaurants, as well as a wide range of fragrant and cutting flowers from all over the world. This is one of her packages. Um, Renee regularly writes a variety of gardening articles and has published three books, including her latest, The Renee's Garden Cookbook, in which she combines her gardener, gardening advice with tasty recipes. Renee is a frequent speaker at garden shows and gardening conferences, and she is a board member of several gardening associations. And in one of her community development roles, she serves on the planning commission for Santa Cruz County. We are delighted that she came down to Los Angeles to present us today with From Garden to Table. Okay, a moment of technical adjustment. Thank you. And just use up. Well, good evening, everybody, both here and virtually. I can't tell you what, how neat and pleasurable it is to be here. I've just had two days of nonstop horticulture in LA, wonderful kind of fantasy uh, experiences. I went to, you know, the Huntington, I went to the Arboretum, we went out to Apricot, Apricot Lane. It's like everyone who loves plants dream two days. And so I really enjoyed it. So. Thank you for having me. It's um, been just a pleasure to come down. Um, I'm from Santa Cruz and I'm here to talk a lot about growing things from seed with the emphasis on kitchen gardening and flower gardening for bouquets and other flowers that you can use in your everyday lifestyle. And um, I'm going to, first of all, spend a little time before I get on with the uh, slideshow which are slides all taken in our trial garden. Uh, our company is based in Santa Cruz and we also have a trial garden in Vermont so we can make sure that the seeds we're offering uh, will grow in cold climates as well. But I am a typical packet seed company in that the seeds we sell come from literally all over the world. Seeds are grown in most countries and a lot of seed is grown in Asia, not necessarily China, but Korea and Japan. Uh, and Indonesia, a lot of seed is grown in Brazil and Argentina, a lot of seed, a lot of flower seed, most nasturtiums, for example, seed for most nasturtiums are grown in Africa, and still a lot of seed is produced in Europe. So by planting a packet of seed, you're really doing a very ecumenical act. Seed comes from all over. And packet seed companies like mine buy the seed from seed producers, both small local ones, especially for unusual and rare things, and also from both family and larger seed companies from all over. We find out about new varieties from the seed companies that produce them. And most packet seed companies, a lot of them like we do, have a large trial garden. For our company, I still write all the packet backs myself based on our, all, our own growing experience. And all the pictures you see today are taken in our trial garden where we test them out. And we can buy seeds from a wide variety of sources. So as I mentioned, um, someone I talked to earlier, we can buy say zinnias from six or seven com companies. And what we try to do is find the best, truest color, the most widely adopted and the mo most useful for a home gardener. Cause that's what we're interested in. We have a great emphasis on kitchen garden seeds, seeds that are widely adopted, really tasty and have a high nutritional value. So we look for different colors of things too. This is, you probably have heard, the more color, the more nutrition, the more antioxidants and so on. Before I start my slideshow though, I wanted to spend a few minutes and just talk about seeds in general and maybe define a few terms that you may find useful if you've wondered about it. So for example, most packet seed companies sell, sell both heirloom seeds and hybrid seeds. 
In other words, heirlooms, which are open pollinated seeds of more than 50 years old and hybrid seeds. And I often get asked, what's the difference? An open pollinated seed is a seed where the seed is pollinated by pollinators, bees, hummingbirds, beneficial insects, or the wind, you know, like corn is often pollinated by the wind blowing the pollen, or many plants like tomatoes have female and male parts. So they're naturally, I guess, quote unquote, naturally uh, pollinated. The advantage of an open pollinated seed is that if you plant the seed it produces, assuming it was separated from similar plants, um, you will get the same variety. So if you grow black seeded Simpson lettuce and save the seed, you will get black Simpson lettuce again, depending on how well you uh, save the seed. The other big category for home gardeners is hybrid seeds. And that's where two different cultivars or varieties are chosen for their particular qualities. In tomatoes, you might choose one variety because it's early and because the color is gray and because it has good disease resistance. And your mother choose, might choose the other variety because it has great flavor or some other particular cultural quality, um, antifungal resistance. So you choose two parents and then you, you, put, you artificially or with bees cross them. So the, they put them in greenhouses. Uh, they will remove all the male parts of one variety and the females from, then they cross them either with bees or by using a paintbrush. So the two varieties cross and produce seeds that, in, that inherently have qualities of both the parents. If you grow a hybrid, you will certainly produce seed, um, but if you plant the seed, it won't necessarily come true. You'll get a lot of variations, just like when people have kids, every kid's different. They don't produce exactly the same replicant. It's very similar to that. So what's better for both home, for home gardens? The answer is, is both have their place. There's a lot of very nice open pollinated varieties. Most flowers and herbs are open pollinated and a great many vegetables. But in today's world, a lot of brassicas, carrots and fruiting vegetables are hybrids and they're bred for disease resistance, earliness, and they're really good for home gardeners. So for example, if I was pl planting Napa cabbage or cauliflower, I for sure would choose a hybrid because they're early. They have incredibly strong disease resistance. They're very uniform, probably bred for quality. But if I was planting lettuce, it wouldn't matter because they're all open pollinated. So they both have a suitable place in home gardens. So if you've ever wondered about that, I wanted to make sure I explained it. Also, people often ask, what about genetically engineered seeds? There are no genetically engineered seed in the home garden market. There never will be. Our customers don't want them. And there's so much rules and regulations around them, we wouldn't be able to sell them even if we had a deep desire to, which we don't. So that is not something you should worry about. What about organic seeds? There's a wide range of certified organic seeds produced and we sell a whole range of them. But the most important thing from my personal point of view is that you garden with organic methods. And these days there are more than ever organic disease and pest controls. So it's getting easier and easier to be an organic garden, gardener. And I think a lot of people do it without, you know, without thinking about it. It's no longer complicated or difficult. So that's a little background on the seed industry and the fact that most seeds you get in packets are grown in very many different places. Seed companies choose which varieties they want to grow. And then we, I, in this case, write the packet, we trial them carefully. And we usually trial several sources of them to find the best ones. So now I think I'll be uh, begin. And if you do have, I went over that quickly. So if you do have any questions about the seed trade in, in general, where seeds come from, that kind of thing, I'll be glad to answer that. So I wanted to show you first, I'll see what I, I don't know what I do with my list, so I'll just go from memory. I first wanted to show you our trial garden. It is like a home garden. We're in uh, outside of Santa Cruz and Felton. Uh, gophers run, run the world <clears throat> from our point of view. And so all our beds are A raised and B underwired with half inch hardware cloth. So you'll only see raised spreads. We're organic gardeners for many years and 
uh, we do use a lot of mulch and drip. So, and a lot of containers. Our company, Renee's Garden, specializes in varieties that do well in containers, which are either smaller or more compact. And there are a lot of varieties now bred for growing in containers. So here is uh, one of the, you want, I wanted to show you what we grow, how we grow things when we're growing trials. So we grow it just like you would, you know, a long bed with maybe eight to 12 feet of each vegetable. Um, we're um, old John Jevons gardener. So we try to arrange it. So when mature, the plants touch each other and cut down on the weeding hugely. And we also grow things that are kind of with an eye to the aesthetics of how they look together too, as you can see. And this is our lower garden where we grow most of our fruity vegetables and a lot of flowers. Another picture, that's my horse Teddy in the background. He's a vital part of the garden for reasons that are obvious. <laughs> so that's, that's our trial garden. This particular one was a trial of short cosmos. There's a lot of dwarf cosmos that grow about 24 to 30 inches. And we were comparing varieties from four different vendors at this particular time. So now I'm gonna launch myself into kitchen gardening by showing you lettuce, greens, cut a gun again, cut and come again, and heading type. And the term cut and come again means you plant it, you let it get four to six inches tall, you cut the tops off, leaving about one inch crowns, you fertilize them and you'll get a second cutting and maybe a, even a third. And it's very popular, came really started in England, but now it's known as baby mescaline, baby lettuce, cut and come again. They all mean the same thing. And it's not just lettuce, you can do that with. So this is our farmer's market blend because I first saw this mixture of colors and types at the farmer's market. And you look in these, we grow the varieties individually, and then we make the mixes looking for color, flavor, and texture, because you're gonna need crisp lettuce, you need real buttery ones. So with good seed companies, like I like to think we are, you're gonna get a mix of that that is already determined um, so that you have a lot of heft and texture to, as well as taste. This is our spicy greens mix, which has mustard and arugula, and my zuna in it. And the idea is you grow some of the lettuce greens and then you add about two thirds lettuce and one third of this mix and they've got a really nicely balanced salad. There's a, we have a stir fry mix. You don't have to um, grow all different things. We mix it all up for you and you just cut it when it's four inches tall and heat up the wok. Uh, this is Asian baby leaves. These are all Asian varieties that are very mild and they make a really mild but slightly tangy uh, blend that's really nice with salmon or smoked fish or any kind of strong flavored protein, cheese, eggs. Um, this is a lettuce called Queen of Crunch um, because it's very crunchy and it's uh, so good for tacos because it's really, really crispy. It's much better than even iceberg. And they're so pretty, they look like sea anemones. And this is an old heirloom lettuce called flashy trout bat. It really got its name because it looks like the back of a river trout. It's very, very sweet and crunchy and very heat tolerant actually. And this is a edible landscape lettuce. There's a very uh, well-known uh, author, Rosalind Creasy. She kind of invented the term edible landscaping. And so I named this after her book. Um, but you can see those colors, the more color, the more antioxidants, the more you're doing self a lot of good beside enjoying a great meal. Uh, these are butterheads. The French grow the best butterhead lettuce by far, really tender and soft and velvety and buttery. These are big French butterheads. They grow well and they're surprisingly heat tolerant too. I really advocate growing some cut and come again baby leaf mescaline. But it gets old. Sometimes it's really great to go back to growing great, big, beautiful, big butterheads and making a scrumptious, luxurious blue cheese dressing. Throw on some pecans and maybe some raspberries and you're in business. So this is a time to think about that. Good time to think about starting some lettuce real soon. And then uh, this is the other um, picture I took of these just so you can see what they look like when they're cut. And you can see the, lettuce, the leaves just look buttery. Um, this why grow just green romaine, it also comes red. So if you grow two of these, you make the most gorgeous Caesar salads. And then these are some lettuces we sell, especially for um, 
growing in containers. They're tiny, about the size of two fists, and they're very ornamental. And these are our little garden baby butterheads. They're really cute. They're very dense. And each one, if you cut it in half, makes a perfect salad for one hungry person or two less hungry people. <laughs> I wanted to show you other things you can grow by the cut and come again method. This is a baby chard that we specially chose because it doesn't get real stemmy. And it's really, you can eat it at this stage as a lettuce salad, but you can also stir fry it in about two seconds. And you get such a big harvest with a like two square feet of it, you've got enough for four or six meals. I wanted to show you some of the different, beside rainbow chard, which we see in the supermarket all the time, there's all these neon colors that are real treat to grow. Um, this is a triple curled Dutch uh, kale. The Dutch eat a lot of kale. They have probably 70 varieties. Um, this is triple curled. It's very sweet. It's just beautiful. Uh, this is a container kale. This, this is it at as tall as it gets. And it's a lacy, uh, double curled chard. You can see how pretty it is in containers. So you can have an edible garden in containers that's as pretty as an ornamental one. This is a baby leaf kale. This comes from Italy. They actually eat a lot of kale in Italy. And why we import it from there is the stems are not tough or hairy. Traditional kale, like Siberian kale and Massonato kale, pick this young, it has hairy stems. These are smooth and tender. Boy, is this good with some citrus and peanuts. Uh, like a peanut butter dressing or Thai dressing, really, really good. Maybe some sliced hard boiled eggs. This is a kale I, I got to name called Purple Moon because I thought you might uh, just reminded me of something out of this world. And it's a beautiful color. And remember, purple is one of the most high antioxidant colors you can eat. This is called Italian scallions. They're salad. They're, they're kind of a class that you don't see much in the market. They're neither scallions nor full scape onions. They grow about this size and they're really delicious in salads. Uh, they're mild, and as it heats up, they get a little hotter. They're also great grilled. There's another picture of them. Now I'm going to show you some specialty and rainbow vegetables in different colors. Why grow just green beans when you can grow purple and yellow? And isn't this much more appetizing and appealing? And the virtue of yellow and purple ones is you can find them on the plants really easy. If you've ever grown bush beans, you know, sometimes you can't find them. Uh, the purple ones were originally bred for home garden. And if you blanch them, because people used to freeze a lot of beans and can them, when you blanch them to freeze them, they turn green after three minutes, exactly at the right time you should freeze them. And the yellow ones are pretty buttery flavored. So that, we make this a mix so you can grow all three at once. And here's another mix. These are um, pole rattlesnake and purple pole. The rattlesnake can be eaten as green beans. They're quite tasty. You can eat them and get them, let them get a bit more mature and eat them as fresh beans, or you can let them dry and have them for dried beans. This is a, this is a French variety the bread for growing in a container. What makes it that is it is compact, quite pretty, and the beans all grow at the end of the stems. So it's easy to find them. Really pretty, very popular. And this is a pole bean. This is a Spanish musica. This is the kind of bean where they, for the part of Spain where they um, make, use beans in paella, this is the bean they use. So it's actually from Spain originally. And they're um, big, long, flat Romano beans. They're meaty, really juicy, highly productive, and good to plant a second crop at midsummer because you get a huge fall crop of these. And then finally, these aren't true beans, but these are yard long um, noodle, uh, noodle king beans. They are um, not a true bean, but they taste like one. And they grow two feet long. They're really delicious, quickly stir fried with oyster sauce, garlic, and ginger. Really easy to grow. This is a much more widely adopted variety than uh, a lot of traditional Chinese, Chinese when I, and it's really stunning to see two foot long beans, very productive in the trunk. There's what they look like when they're getting ready to be eaten. There's what they look like on the plants. Pretty wild, huh? I think they look like pigtails. And this is a fresh edamame ready to eat. Edamame are basically grow like bush beans. The, the difference is they all get ripe at once. 
And in Japan, they pull the whole plants up and sell a whole plant with all the beans on it in a market. But they're really, whoops, I wanted to go back. I wanted to talk about that one more time. No, I won't, but I encourage you to try growing edamame when the, the beans swell in the pod, you pick them all, you can freeze them and pull them out six months later and cook them in you know boiling water and then salt them and eat them. They keep really well and are easy to freeze. Uh, we make a mix of all the colors of beets. They're, as you can see, they're really gorgeous. And here's what they look like when you roast them, because you eat with your eyes as well as your mouth. So this is pretty, um, they're just spectacularly pretty and delicious. Uh, this is broccoli rob. This is from Italy. Um, it's, um, you grow it for those little florets. Um, and they're, it's got a wonderful bitterness. You blanch it and then saute it in olive oil and garlic. And, uh, put lemon juice or really freshly grated Parmesan in. It's delicious if you've probably, it's getting more popular, so you're starting to see it in supermarkets. It's a cool weather crop. You want to plant it soon and you can plant it again for fall. Here's what it looks like when it's harvested. Uh, these are round. If you don't have a garden, you grow in containers from the round carrots. They don't have to go very far down. These were developed outside the surroundings of Paris, which has very hard clay soil. And back when you know, market vegetables were grown close to the city, they developed these carrots that didn't have to go down very far in the clay. This is a very popular mix for us. I say it's our second or third best selling variety. There's purple carrots, um, orange carrots and white carrots. Orange carrots are relatively new phenomena. Uh, two, three centuries ago, carrots were white, um, and there were some yellow ones, but these are um, now becoming more popular, and they all have different antioxidant profiles. These purple ones actually taste good. The first purple ones were tasted like soap, but these actually taste really good, and what a, what a eye candy they are. That's what they look like when you pull them. And this is a, another, um, this is a Chantenay, an old, very old variety, very sweet, and it's virtuous, and they're short. So if you have clay soil, they only grow about four inches long. It's an organic variety. Purple cauliflower bred in Korea. Um, it holds its color when you cook it. Uh, it's just a stunner, uh, a really nice roasted. Uh, celeriac, uh, getting more popular now. Um, they are. Not the most beautiful things, kind of look like hippopotamus hooves, but you peel them and then you cut them up and they usually eat them with a lemon mayonnaise, but you can also roast them. If you're into roasting vegetables and who isn't, celeriac with your potatoes and carrots and sweet potatoes, they add, they have a flavor of parsley, turnips and apples, I would say. They make a great slaw. And then I'm gonna go to some fruity vegetables. These are tiny baby Persian cucumbers been around in the Middle East for a couple of centuries. These are a hybrid, originally bred in Israel, interestingly enough, but we get these from the Czech Republic. And uh, they are pretty much seedless. You can eat the skins, they're very prolific. It's easy to grow as any cucumber, but so, so good. And you're starting to see these in supermarkets and clamshells, but when you grow your own, you can have them every, every day for months. That's what they look like. And uh, on the other hand, these are long traditional English telegraph type cucumbers that are smooth. And these are the kinds you buy in the supermarket for $2.99 to $5.99 in the plastic wrap. Why not grow them yourself? These are from Holland. They're a very fancy hybrid, but they grow very easily as well. And we just added cornichons, true French cornichons. These are the little ones you get in bars and with pate. Uh, each one has two bites, maybe. Um, and you, you uh, pickle them in just a vinegar water uh, solution with what with your favorite herbs. That's what they look like on the plant. They're so cute. And then I wanted to move to eggplant. You, we have a lot of packets that have three, three different varieties in them. So you can grow a few of each and we color code them with food dye. So these are three from Italy. These are three from Asia. So you can have all this abundance and diversity in your backyard really easily. By the way, eggplants are very big feeders. If you have trouble with eggplants, they really want a, a high nitrogen feed maybe at least once a month. Whoops, I mean to go forward. Let's see if I can, yeah. Then, you know, everybody grows vegetables, but I just want to give you a sense of how beautiful they are if you have a lot of different colors. Uh, kohlrabi, 
Interestingly enough, the uh, Eastern European sea kohlrabi and the Japanese sea kohlrabi, and they independently have bred all these different varieties. These are Japanese ones, and I just wanted to show you the colors. These are really fun to grow with kids uh, because they look like, uh, you know, spaceships. And you peel off, you haven't eaten kohlrabi, you just peel the outer skin off and slice it up thin. It's delicious raw with hummus or any dip. It tastes like apples and a little bit of turnips. It's really crunchy. So if you like get the munchies, you don't want to eat chips, you can really enjoy the kohlrabi. You can also roast it. It's delicious. It sweetens up and saute it. It's a, it's a wonderful vegetable. Another, this is a particularly cool season lover. Very easy to grow. And then pak choy and Asian vegetables are ever more popular. This is what we call a hand pak choy because it's sits in the, it's little plump, fat little thing and sits in the palm of your hand, cooks in about 90 seconds. You know, you can take it out of the garden and be eating dinner three minutes later. Uh, they're plump and very, very juicy and sweet. Don't really need much, a little garlic and ginger. You don't really need too much else. Then I wanted to show you some chilies. Your area is a particularly good one and it's a huge universe. There's 26 hundred chili varieties, I think. Uh, these are Bulgarian carrot chilies. They're fruity and hot at the same time. They grow like little candelabras. These are uh, basically from Croatia and uh, really worth growing. And look at the yield on that. They're short little plants, maybe 18 inches tall, adorable in a container. Um, these are rainbow chilies. This is um, red here in the United States by Aaron Whaley. So you get why have only green and red jalapenos? We have orange ones and yellow ones. If you pickle jalapenos, why not have a rainbow colors? That's what I'm going to show you quickly. Um, here's the red one, here's the orange one, and here's the yellow one. And they're all in the same packet, so you can have a whole little rainbow in your packet. Thai chilies. Um, these are one's mild, medium, and one's really hot, and you can harvest the whole plant when it's all colored up and hang it up in your garage to dry and then pick off the dried chilies and grind them up and have your own pizza toppings or anything else where you ever want to add chili. Uh, these are uh, Spanish Padron. This is the real deal. Um, these are the ones that you harvest when they're just one and a half inches long, very small. They're very early, hugely productive. And then you put them in a uh, sizzling, heat some olive oil in a pan and sizzle them up for three, four minutes so they look like this. Throw a little salt on them. And in Spain, you'd have them with cherry, but here you have them with beer and they're really good and very healthy. You eat the whole thing and about every 10th or 15th one is a hot one. That's part of the whole charm. There's a shisho or shishito that sold a lot down here, but that's because they didn't used to be able to get the real deal. These, these were really worth going. They're really fast and easy. The plants grow three and a half, four feet tall. And the key is to pick them when they're tiny, tiny, tiny. Because when they get two inches or bigger, they're pretty tasteless and tough. And then of course, I don't need to tell everyone that there's all kinds of colors of peppers, sweet peppers. And these are bred again, um, in the Czech Republic and Poland, they're the yummy bells. You're seeing these, you know, you see these in the supermarket, but they're kind of expensive. They're really, really sweet and very, very productive. This would be perfect here. You'd have them for a whole seed, but these are orange ones. And then we said red, we sell red and yellow ones too. So, and these are Italian roasting peppers. It's the opposite extreme. These are big, long, huge thing. They're called bull's horn peppers for obvious reasons. And these are Corna de Toros, they're very popular in Italy. So, you know, peppers are from the new world and Europe has, and Asia have all uh, separated them into hundreds and hundreds of varieties, all of which are fun to grow. That's what they look like. We made a pizza with them. What's not to like? It's just so attractive and appetizing looking. And uh, radishes, think of radishes as red. Here's some, we sell this mix of five colors. So when you cut them up in a salad, gosh, it's just gorgeous. Or you can slice them thin, put them on rye bread with sweet butter and a little salt. That's really good too. You can saute them too. And why am I not going forward? Did I get stuck? Wait a minute, let me go backward. 
it stuck. Help. It didn't move. It moved on my screen, but not on that screen. Should I, can I do anything? Somebody? Maybe I'm just doing the wrong thing. Help. Okay. Can you you want to do it for me? Okay. Okay, I'll try again. What am I? It doesn't like me. Okay. I skipped honey nut squash. Watermelon radish, you're all probably familiar with. These are an Asian radish. They are not a spring or fall radish. They are a different kind of radish than the kind you grow in two weeks and eat in salads. They're they really need to be planted like in June or July or even August here. They take 90 days to maturity. And if you ever tried them and they were a total waste of time, that's why they really need to be grown differently. When they are, when grown right, and they do take a couple months, they're very tender and sweet, beautiful, as you can see. And this is honey nut squash. This is a climbing butternut that maybe is six to eight inches long. It's intensely sweet. It has some buttercup. Um, blood in it was bred for organic growers and they are very easy to grow and whoops and best of all you can grow them up a trellis so if you have a small garden you can grow them up strings on a couple of poles and you'll have they're very prolific and these last I'm still eating them from once I harvested last November and they haven't really uh, you know deteriorated at all uh, this is the other extreme for climbing squashes this is an Italian specialty it means uh, tr climbing trumpet. And they look like that if you've ever grown them. Yeah. They have that bulb at the bottom where the seeds are. Otherwise, they taste like a cross between summer squash and artichoke. They're really delicious and they're really fun to grow. They do grow, they will grow into big, tough things that you can. Reminds me of that old Alfred Hitchcock story where the woman kills her husband with the frozen lake of lamb and then makes the lamb for the police officers who come to investigate the murder. You could probably do that with it. Um, but why grow one color squash, summer squash, you can grow all these different color scallops at once. They all hold their color. Boy, do these are beautiful in pasta with lots of cheese and garlic and basil and these really good. Uh, this is a traditional Romanesco zucchini. If you go to Rome or a lot of different parts of Italy and they put out the plates of what they have in the restaurant. They have these big trays of these with their flowers attached, really slender and straight. And that's to lure you in the restaurant, which they will. And you can have them grow yourself really easily. This is our one of our new introductions. This is a German one. It's a climbing zucchini. Now you do have to tie it up. It's not gonna climb itself, but it is such a pleasure to harvest your zucchini at waist level or eye level than having to search for them as they grow bigger and bigger under the leaves. And this is a big, vigorous plant that almost has a life of its own, but you could trellis it really easily. And they're very good. Uh, this is the other stream. This is a variety bred in France, zucchini specifically for containers. It grows great in containers and see how the squash grow really close to the base of the plant so they don't get away from you. It's very productive and very good. And they're very attractive in so that's another one to try. And then finally, this is a very old French variety, Rondonis. They grow in little um, uh, eight ball shapes and you can stuff them, which is really nice, or hollow them out and do different things with them. So that was uh, the squash section. I'm gonna run through a few tomatoes. Tasmanian chocolate is a container tomato, grows about three foot tall. It's a true chocolate. It was bred by a, a group of people who specialize in breeding tomatoes for containers. This is an old heirloom variety called tangerine. And you can make golden gazpacho with it. Nothing like all the different colors together. You don't have to do much else, just lay them down. Uh, you can make your own tomato sauce. You should use a San Marzano sauce tomato. This one is from Italy. They really are better for making tomato sauce because they're not full of juice, but they're still very flavorful. You can also be fresh and if you want to make tomato sauce, the easy way is to throw them all whole in plastic bags. And then in January, 
when it's freezing cold and you don't feel like going outside, that's when you make your tomato sauce. And the tomatoes then the skin slip right off too. These are sweet treats. There are three different little colored, different colors of tomatoes. Again, we put all three seeds in a packet, so you can have all three. They're pretty adorable, I think, and very, very sweet. That's black cherry, and I'll go a little heirloom. This is from England, where tomatoes don't grow very well until recently. Um, and this is called Little Bites. This is great for a little six or eight inch container and they cascade and they produce all season. And then finally, here's a veggie salad using some of those beautiful colored tomatoes, layered salad. Why grow regular watermelon? We can also grow orange ones and yellow ones. These are all from Korea, uh, which they're crazy for melons and they are small, so they don't take up a lot of room and early. This is new from France. There are many loves they are, believe it or not, watermelons designed for container growing. So each one will give you three or four. I mean, you're not gonna get a dozen uh, in a container, but they're about four inches in diameter and each one's one person's little watermelon. They're really good too. Few culinary oils worth mentioning. Uh, arugula comes in three shapes. They've been developed so it holds more dressing in salad bars, which I think is interesting. So the one uh, in the middle is what's developed to hold uh, more sticky dressing. The one on the right is the traditional one, and the one on the left is the rustic one. Uh, this is wasabi arugula. It's a rustic or perennial arugula that, honest to God, tastes like wasabi. It was accidentally bred by a mustard breeder, and then he realized it was unique. Um, and, and we carry it and it really tastes exactly like wasabi that you get at the Japanese restaurant, really good. Uh, this is basil uh, perfume de Genova from Italy that has a really intense perfume. Um, Thai basil on the other hand is really getting more and more popular. It's very ornamental, big pollinator flower. Let your first basil crop go to seed and flower. It's a tremendous pollinator and beneficial insect attractor and plant another one. Here in your climate, here in the LA area, you can probably grow three crops of basil. So people say, what do I do to keep my basil from going to flower? And the answer is don't, just plant more basil three weeks after you plant the first crop and you'll have a continuous supply, especially when your tomatoes are ripe, you're not gonna, they're not gonna have basil from your first crop, maybe from your second. Um, a lot of people don't realize that basil comes not only in regular pesto type green basil, but purple basil, lemon basil, cinnamon basil, anise basil. There's all these different flavors. We sell three of them in this mixed packet. Here is salad leaf basil. These leaves are three inches long and you use them to wrap a slice of cheese in them or maybe or a little chunk of cheese or shrimp or a piece of ham. I mean, you, they're delicious. It's a mild buttery flavored basil. It makes a real mellow pesto and they're really pretty in the bark, slow to bowl. Uh, this is um, yeah, this really comes from Vietnam. It's bok lao cilantro. You can eat it even when it's flowering. It's a little more lacy, a slightly more lemony flavor than regular cilantro. Um, this is an heirloom Italian oregano, a little different than Greek. This is the white flowered ones we're most familiar with. Uh, this is a lavender bread for containers. It doesn't get large and unruly. It's very French. It's an angustifolia, very sweet. This is a white one. Uh, then you can grow your own crocus. They're very easy to grow. You plant them. We get the seed, the uh, crocuses from Holland in late fall. They get shipped to you in late September. You put them in as soon as it starts to cool down and they produce the saffron crocuses within the first couple of months. And you pull, see those orange stamens? That's what you pull off and you dry, lay them on a uh, kitchen towel, uh, paper towel, and they dry, and you, know, you let them dry for a week and put them in a jar, and then you've got your own um, saffron, and they multiply. So first year, you get two flowers, and then each one will get three, and then five flowers. It lasts a long time. See, up there, that's a good picture. In the summer, after they, after they bloom and you pick the stamens, they go dormant, and all you see is the grassy tops. And then the next summer, they go completely dormant, and you have to mark where you planted them because they don't show their face until autumn. They're kind of counterintuitive for most of us. But you can really get a lot of, produce enough saffron to really have them. There's a really good picture. 
these are alpine strawberries also grown from seed. You start them when you start uh, tomatoes indoors. Um, they produce four inch plants the first year from seed and start making berries. These berries about an inch long, they taste like strawberries crossed with roses. They're really delicious. In France, they put them on little, teeny little tarts and there you can have a handful every day and put them in your cereal. Their virtue is they do not throw runners and they're very perennial and they will lovely self-sow and they make a wonderful edging or container plant, they're just delicious. You have to get them from seed. They're never, never sold in stores because they're too delicate, but they're very hardy. Here's a yellow grower and herbal teas that you can grow. I want to call your attention that you can grow a lot of your own. This is zinger. You know, it's what's in that red zinger tea, hibiscus. You, you save the, dry the calyxes and make your own. This is extremely healthy, a high end, very high end antioxidant value. And it tastes kind of like a, a little like cranberries. Spices, you can grow your own. Uh, paprikas, cumin, vinegars, make your own with your herbs. It's really easy to do. We covered it in our cookbooks. With just, and I'll finish with just a few of my favorite edible flowers. These are blossom sandwiches made with edible flowers and herb flowers. When your, flower, when your herbs go to flower, beside leaving them for all the pollinators, pick some, make a cucumber um, spread. These are just little sandwiches with um, flower petals and herb blossoms on them. They're really pretty. Nasturtiums are wonderfully edible. I think it's everyone's favorite edible flower. If you've never eaten one, they taste like watercress with a touch of honey. It's really good with salmon and shrimp. Really nice in a, in a potato salad, added to a green salad. This is one that was bred for hanging baskets and it's got this, these great chamois colors and oranges and pale colors. Uh, this is uh, uh, one that has variegated leaves. This is Alice Waters' favorite, most chefs' favorite one called Empress of India. It's this gorgeous crimson scarlet. This is the other extreme, it's called Aloha Mix. A lot of people don't realize that nasturtiums come in all these different colors. Then pansies are edible. You, uh, the best way to use them is a little fussy, but kind of fun for a little craft project. You uh, get some uh, fine, uh, extra fine sugar and you beat up an egg and paint the pansy flowers with the beaten egg and then sprinkle the super fine sugar on them and dry them. And then you've got candy. Uh, pansies or violas. Calendulas are good for color and flavor with eggs and cheese. And all, all these ideas and more in my cookbooks because I've always felt if I convince you to grow a huge basket of radicchio or fennel or romano beans, I better give you some ideas on how to cook with it. And we test everything in the kitchen. So I, I have some if you're interested. And I invite you to come and visit more. We have a lively newsletter with recipes and ideas and lots of YouTube videos. So that's my slideshow. Thank you. So um, I thought maybe I'd take a little time as soon as we get the lights on. Um, I gave you a packet of seeds to take home. Please do read the instructions. I have 237 words to tell you everything I know, think, or desire about a particular scene. And I uh, spend a lot of midnight oil trying to condense it to that. So that would be my first direction. Read this, please. <laughs> uh, we put a lot of time into them. Um, and a lot of people also ask how long they can keep seeds. Seeds have different uh, lengths of time to do all the germination is good. So we pack them in July and they're good for 18 months. If you want to keep seeds for more than one season, put them in a sealed mason jar in the refrigerator for long-term storage, freeze them. 
but a sealed mason jar where you take them out of the freezer, let them come back to room temperature. So a lot of seeds, you can pause their decline because leaf seeds are alive um, by freezing them. They are cryo, but you can uh, put them in cryogenic storage in deep freezer. <laughs> but generally buying from a group, cheap seeds are no bargain because you really don't know what you're getting. You want to buy seeds from a good reputable company. Spending two, three, four dollars for a seed packet is cheaper than what you're getting for it. So uh, I encourage you to buy seeds that are from a good company with good information. That's really important. Um, anyway, I'd be glad to take a few questions if you have any about seeds in general, seeds in specific. Yes. Uh, you know, I can't, if I, I can't remember. Uh, if I had a packet in hand, I could tell you, but if you look up on our website, that doesn't come tripping off my mind, but um, it's, really, it's still talking at me. Um, they're very good. I plant two crops because they have a very intense harvest season and then they're through. So we plant some and two weeks later, we plant another crop. They're very prolific. They don't freeze particularly well. We want to eat them fresh. You can make the, you know, what do you use them for? Hey, eat, um, black, you know, those yard long beans with black bean sauce and garlic is to die for. Make your own. Um, or I always order that in, you know, a lot of Chinese restaurants. So now that's why I've sought them out. Anybody else have a question? Yes. So it's not the, was it or was it it's arugula. Arugula. Is it a cost? Well, most. Well, first of all, you know that most of the wasabi that you buy, 99.9% is really horseradish to the green. There is wasabi being grown up in the Bay Area now. It's very fussy. And the Japanese really, it's only the last seven or eight years that they, it's even, even come, wasabi roots have been imported. They really kept it pretty close to the chest. So it's very hard to get real wasabi. You have to go to a real high-end Japanese restaurant because there's not much in production there. So compared to that, yes, it's, it will make your eyes water. But it has, it tastes just like, anybody else? Yes. Well, 300 to 350 varieties we test, but they are all new ones. You know, like that Persian cucumber, we tested Persian cucumbers from six or seven producers to find the ones that we thought was really white, more productive and widely adopted and disease resistant, tasted good, all that stuff. Um, so a lot of what we grow is and we second source things. So we have, for example, an apricot colored zinnia. I didn't even touch flowers here. We carry a wide range of annual flowers for the bays. Like we have 18 colors of zinnias and lots of different cosmos and many sweet peas and a lot of other flowers. Um, so we are always try to find the best selection. So, but we grow it all in small patches, like you see, and we plant usually three crops. We start early and end late. Yes. That's what you can read. Oh, thank you for asking. Um, you do have to rotate. Um, we do different families. We can't get away from that. Other than that, we are huge advocates of cover cropping. We, we think it's improved the fertility and tilt and substance of our soil more than anything else. Okay. We cover crop heavily. We happen to have I have three horses, so we make a lot of compost and carbon based manure. So we turn over beds, um, you know, the top. Three or four inches, we add a layer of compost an inch. Um, whenever we change a crop, we try to improve the soil. We cover crop during the winter and either weed whack it and put a lot of plastic over it or cut it off and compost it and put it back. And we fertilize a lot. The garden you see is a garden. A lot of people think if they add a little compost or manure, that's fertilizer, but it's not. So we're organic gardeners, there's a lot of good organic fertilizers. All our, but we have very sandy soil, so we have to fertilize it. It all just sinks into the soil, but we fertilize at least once a month. 
and we get better results because we are asking that lettuce plant to produce a huge, massive head. We want our broccoli to produce lots of side shoots. We want things to do weight. You know, plant wants to grow, make a flower, produce a head, and then make seed and die. So anybody cares about making one giant zucchini. We want it to keep going and go and going. So they need to be encouraged and fed and tended. We, we keep things pretty carefully weeded. And we really try to get a community of plants. We find plants don't like to be one here. You know, people who buy a six pack of zinnias and plant one here, one over there. You know, plants like to be with each other. So um, we do that. Yes. Oh, we sell a cover crop mix and we also use must a good mustard. Mustard has fumic in it, really can help you control fusarium versus wilt if you plant it in solarizing. So we use a combination of things that pull, you know, that add nitrogen to the soil, that add biomass. So di different things, you know, it depends which product uh, you choose, but that is becoming a really important part regenerative gardening, which is what we're all looking at now, which is protecting the soil and increasing its, you know, its fungal qualities and the mycelium. So you, you build your soil, you have a good crop. That's pretty much it. Yes. You mentioned you use plastic. When we cover crop and we, we whack it down in those beds, we do cover it with plastic when it really heats up to help break it down quickly, just for a couple of weeks. And then we take it off and turn it in. You can also not do that. You can weed whack it down and take off the, the tops and then just and compost them and then just turn over roots, turn over what's left in the soil, add some compost and plant into it pretty quick, quickly actually. In other words, the soil's never bare. There's always something happening. Yes. Want to start that indoors where you can really watch it because it's going to take three weeks to germinate. It's worth it though, believe me. You get for one packet, you get 60 or 70 left. So I think it's worth it. Yes. Oh, you know, there's there's a lot of good ones, Dr. Burst Good. You know, we've traded them around. There's a lot of good products. Out there. So, no, not particularly. They're so regional. What we have up in, even in Santa Cruz, you may have something different down here. Um, but there's a lot to choose from. There didn't used to be. And there's nothing like making your own, you know, preparing your own compost and you can make your own honey so if you want to. But I think they're good organic fertilizers. Foliar feeding is a very handy technique too. And when you're feeding seedlings, the old standard mixture of fish emulsion and liquid kelp, liquid kelp, a tablespoon of gallon of water, may be a little stinky, but you still can't feed it and it's very inexpensive. Oh, I'm sorry. I should be questions. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, liquid fish emulsion. 
and liquid kelp, uh, which has a lot of enzymes that benefit plants and micronutrients, a tablespoon of each to a gallon of water. You can either apply that in the soil or, or follow your feed in. Of course, it's a little stinky. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, I like uh, sunflowers. I really like the dark red ones. We, we have two or three of them that are deep burgundy. And I like ones that are multi-stem because they look like lace. And, but I'm a sucker for a 15 foot high Sunzilla hybrid. You know? I, like, I think I like them all, actually. I do like to look for ones that are good for uh, bouquets. There's a lot of florist varieties now that are multi, that, that flower, that have a lot of branching. So would that mean that they form the pollenless end? Pollenless ones don't have pollen, but they do have nectar. So they still benefit a lot of pollinators. A lot of the pollenless ones were developed for florists because sunflowers are very important floral or floral arrangements, but the pollen drops like crazy. That's, that's where they're pumped from. There's a wide range of both pollen, with pollen and pollen less. So, but it's not, it's not true that they are sterile in the sense of that they don't help pollinators who are drinking that. Yes. Oh, she, he, I'm sorry. He asked, what is your favorite sunflower? And what about pollenless sunflowers? She asked, California, California poppies are orange, but I've known California poppies from here that are pink and white and other colors. That's because there are other colors of California poppies. And the way those were developed is a plant breeder, mostly in Holland, were a field of California poppies, and the one that was oranger than the others. So we saved seed from that, planted it again, saved the reddest one. And you know, after some generations, he got a red California puppy, which there is. Same with pink, same with white. Even if you look at a field of California poppies, there's quite a bit of different color variation. So California poppies, we have a mixture that's called tequila sunrise after the drink um, and, and has many colors in it. So there are many colors. Now, are they gonna stay coming up those colors? If they set seed, they'll probably eventually revert back to golden yellow. Yes, so you can get white ones, pink ones, red ones, orange ones, carmine colored ones. You can have a lot of fun with them. The other puppies we sell are surely puppies. Well, I never say it right. Someone help me, Roseas isn't how you say it. How do you say that? Roseas, the other species of puppies that come in a multitude of both soft and bright shades. And we sell significant uh, poppies that are deep purple. There's just a huge range. It's a huge class of flowers with many colors. Yes. What happens to all the food? Oh, it all manages to get eaten. I have to sometimes take it to the people in the office. They, I can't get them to come and harvest everything. So, I, but um, yeah, it manages. I have a lot of friends who I've now taught to come and pick things. I used to have to invite them over and pick it for them, but finally I've trained everybody. Um, and, and we try to cook with everything. I mean, when we grow corn, it all looks good and tastes okay raw, but we got, we, you know, just line it up, cook five varieties for three minutes and everybody comes in and that's what we do for lunch. So we do really do a lot of testing in the kitchen as well. Anybody else? Anything else you've always wanted to know about seeds, storing them, keeping them? Um, I have a different approach because I found in the years I've been doing it, if I buy high quality lettuce seed from France or Italy or the United States, if you grow it in the right weather for growing lettuce in your climate, will grow perfectly well. Uh, the uh, Romano musica beans, they're from Spain, now they're growing in Italy and France, starting to see them in supermarkets. They'll grow anywhere you can grow beans. Here in SoCal, you can grow almost anything, frankly, if you plant it at the right time. So that's the key. 
What's the right time? Well, seed packets, including ours, could arrange them. Ask other gardeners. And you can also learn over time to learn when, when certain things happen in the outdoor garden, that's the time to plant. Um, you know, there's relationship being when, when lilacs bloom or when camellias blossom, it's a time to plant lettuce and so on. But for everyday purposes to, to start noticing things like that. Um, here, it's now getting time to plant greens and root vegetables. It's time to start heat lovers, eggplants, tomatoes, and peppers. Generally speaking, fruiting vegetables, you shouldn't grow until the nights are in the 50s or set them out until nights are in the 50s. In early spring, you can grow everything green and leafy and ruby. And that's, you know, as soon as frost, age of frost is over. When it warms up and the nights are in the 50s, then all the heat loving vegetables and flowers can be planted. You know, that's a very generalized subject, but we write pretty precise directions. Gardening is really special because it's, it can be learned from other people and gardeners are happy to share their knowledge. This way to learn how to garden, I'm sure you can certainly go to a lot of social media and on the web, but walk down the street and find someone else who's a good gardener and they'll be usually probably pretty pleased to, to help you out. All gardeners want to help other gardeners because we all care about the same things. Um, she asked about um, what what do you do? What do you suggestions do you have for seedlings dying off at two or three inches? So what I would ask her if she were here is, do they thin out at the middle of the stem and then turn over and die? If they do, then you have damping off, which is the most common prevalent thing that happens to tiny seedlings. And it happens for usually two reasons. Even you haven't sterilized your containers, which I mean, one part bleach to 10 parts water before you start with them. You know, the little seedling trays need to be properly clean and you've kept them too moist and allowed fungus to grow. It's a damping off of fungus and they all keel over. So if that happens, dump everything out, sterilize everything in that kind of very simple way and start all over again. Make sure they have good air circulation and damping off is easily overcome, but it's usually because you things are too wet, um, and, and you get, you basically get the fungus. Okay, well, do they, do, uh, the question was, what do you suggest for the apartment dweller who doesn't have any outdoor beds uh, or that, or southern facing windows. So I, you need to ask this person if they have a patio, even a tiny terrace, which most apartments seem to. If you have there, you can put containers out and grow, you know, as long as you get at least six hours of sun, you can grow almost anything because there are many varieties that you can't grow in containers. If you don't have six hours of sun, it's much, it is truly much more limited. And then you might want to grow a grow light and grow some fresh herbs. Uh, with a tabletop grow line. Those are easy. And, and also some sal a few salad greens, but you do need to have enough light. And I would also encourage anyone who has that kind of more complex question, if you write your question to us at customer service at renaesgarden.com and tell us where you live and write out your question, we have a full-time horticultural advisor who lives in Claremont. So she ought to be able to and she, has, she was my ex-partner and she has 30 years of growing everything, so she'll be able to help you. We do ask that you buy our seeds though. <laughs> so um, anybody else? Oh, they love the purple kale. Okay, well, thank you very much. And anybody who's interested in a couple? Oh, you're welcome.